Hello, I'm Paul Dutois and we're talking presentation skills. I want you to imagine that you've been invited to somebody's house for supper. So before you leave, you make sure that you've got the address, you're able to either put it into your navigational system or else you look to where you're going on the map and you also estimate approximately how long it's going to take from start to finish so that you know how soon you have to leave. Now let's relate all this to a presentation. Before you start putting your presentation together, where are you going to actually start? Well, logically at the beginning, wouldn't you say? Well, logic isn't always correct because I usually advise my delegates to start their presentations at the end from a preparation point of view. And why should they do that? Well, quite simply, when you put together a presentation, you need to know what the objective of that presentation is. In other words, you need to ask yourself, what is it that you want that audience to do after you've finished your presentation? And it's quite remarkable because if you've worked out what it is that you want them to do, you can then work out how you want to end your presentation so that you get the result that you want. Now that you've got the ending in place, it's very, very easy for you to know how to begin your presentation. So you've now got your goalpost in place, you've got your ending, you've got your beginning, and hey, aren't you the expert on the topic? So it's not a question of having to dig up a whole lot of content, you know what the body of your presentation is going to be like anyway. So once you've got that ending point, it's remarkable how quickly your structure can be put in place. Now if you're listening to a presentation and it flows in a natural progression, it's properly introduced, uh, you get a bulk of information to listen to and you have a nice strong ending at the end, well isn't that the way that you'd like to be able to process information so that there's a logical follow through and you're able to make a decision at the end. It's not only good for the audience, it's good for you too. Because every time you're able to do that, your confidence increases, your experience increases, and you simply become a better presenter. When I deliver my presentation skills classes, one of the top items on the agenda is how to handle fear. Now, what kind of fear? What are the things that we fear when we get up in front of an audience? Besides, audiences actually want us to succeed, so what is it that we're afraid of? Well, quite simply, we have a fear of the unknown, and if there are people in the audience that we're not familiar with, we immediately regard them as being hostile. Uh, it's nonsensical, but it's the way we feel about it. Just think about how you react when you walk into a networking event and you're supposed to start meeting people. You go and stand with the people you know instead of mixing the way that you should do. So we ha automatically have this fear. So let's look at some of the main things that we're afraid of and that create fear in the context of presentations. Firstly, we're afraid of presenting in a language that is not our mother tongue. Understandably, because it's often more difficult to find the words. Uh, we're afraid of maybe losing our way during the presentation. We're afraid of not having sufficient content or perhaps running out of things to say. We're afraid of being fried during question time. In other words, a question being asked that we don't know the answer to. And we're also afraid of being simply plain boring. And that's not much fun, is it? So let's look at a few ways that we can deal with these things specifically. If it's the fear of presenting in a language that is not your mother tongue, you need to then make sure that you clearly understand your content, that you've rehearsed it enough so that you're familiar with what you have to say. And if there are any difficult words that you may need to use that you're not familiar with, that you rehearse those a few times in advance so that you know what it is that you're going to say. Then the fear of losing one's way is a really very prominent fear. And what has happened in the modern day is that people tend to use their slides as a prompt. And by doing that, you break your eye contact, which is not a very good thing in a presentation context. So one of the things that I advise my delegates to do is to use a simple thing called cue cards. Now, cue cards are fantastic because it actually looks to the audience as if you've prepared adequately. Whereas if you had an A4 piece of paper, they'd automatically groan and think to themselves, oh my goodness, he's going to stand and read it to me. By using cue cards, you can make a few short notes and you can refer to those notes by simply looking down as you come to the end of the sentence, picking up the idea, looking up and then speaking. The tip, however, is to make sure that you only write a few words per line on the cue card and that you restrict yourself to five or six lines so that you don't become confused. Then there's also the fear of not having enough content and that can be quite critical because 
if you feel that you don't have enough content, you're automatically going to put in too much content. And by putting in too much content, it's going to ensure that you run over time or that you find yourself put under pressure at the end of your presentation. So that's something that you don't want to happen. During question time, uh, the fear of being fried is very real. Um, it's really just uh, a way of saying that people are going to ask you some difficult questions. And the best technique that I can give you to handle that fear is to get into the habit of repeating the question in your own words. Even if it takes you between four and nine seconds to repeat that question, that brief period of time is just enough to allow you to order your thoughts and give some kind of answer that is credible, even if it's a difficult question for you to handle. Then that question of being boring, well, I'll give you a great way of dealing with that. Simply record your presentation. Listen for the tone of voice, listen for whether you sound enthused or not, listen to whether you sound as if you know what you're talking about. And if it sounds good to you, it's good. But if it sounds boring to you, guess what? It's going to be boring to your audience. So it's something that you need to do something about. However, all these fears that I've just spoken of tap into one central fear. And that central fear is the fear of what other people will think of us. And whether we believe this or not, it affects just about every single human being. Whether we should or whether we shouldn't, we do value what other people think of us. So how is it that you get over that fear that really permeates into all the other fears? Well, there's a few techniques that you can use. The first one is make sure that you're adequately prepared. If you're adequately prepared and you know what you're going to say, you're over the first hurdle. The second thing is that make sure that you have rehearsed adequately, that you know what you're going to say, that you've been through it a few times, that you know the flow of your presentation, you know where you're going to start, you know what you're going to say, and you know how you're going to end. Another important thing is to trust yourself. And you can only really do that as you become more and more experienced. So it's a pretty tough thing to say, but you need to get out there and present more and more and more. And if you make a few mistakes, let me put this into your mind. Who said that you had to be perfect? Was the objective of your presentation to be perfect or was it to get the result that you want? And I'm sure that it's the latter. So if you can ensure that you get out there, do the best you can, trust yourself, and where it doesn't go 100%, learn from it. Where it does go 100% and you get the result you want, well, celebrate. And if it wasn't perfect and you still get the result that you wanted, well, you can celebrate even more. Because presentations get better and better the more experienced you get. And you'll find that if you just keep at it, the fear will eventually dissipate. I'm not saying that it'll completely disappear, because it's perhaps a good thing to have a little bit of anxiety, but you'll find that it becomes easier and easier the more experienced that you become. They say that an amateur practices until they get it right, but a professional practices until they can't get it wrong. In the context of presenting, are you the amateur or the professional? When you're acting on stage, you need to be professional because when you get to the end of a particular line, that's the cue for the next actor to come in. But a presentation is usually a little different because very often you do a presentation on your own and you're not queuing up another actor. So you can be a little bit more spontaneous and you don't have to learn your lines verbatim. In this context, you don't have to be a professional and you don't have to be perfect, but you do need to know what it is that you're going to say. So bearing in mind that you're usually asked to present on something where you are in fact the subject expert, it's not necessary to deliver it off route. You can simply speak spontaneously around your topic and make sure that like a road map, uh, you've got uh, particular stop-off points where you change direction or change gears or slow down and start off again, but it doesn't have to be uh, off by heart as such. So, from a rehearsal point of view, do you need to rehearse it 10, 15 or 20 times? And I'm sure that the answer is absolutely not. My rule of thumb, quite simple and straightforward, is that you rehearse your presentation perhaps two to three times. The first time is there so that you familiarize yourself with what you planned. And in rehearsing it, you find out what works, what doesn't work, the bits that should maybe change to another area. In other words, maybe you should say a certain thing later rather than earlier. Maybe you should insert something else in. Maybe this bit you can leave out completely because it doesn't add to your presentation. So that first rehearsal is simply just a practice run. 
The second rehearsal is where it all kind of falls into place because I usually find after my first rehearsal that I'm feeling pretty re depressed because, well, it just didn't go well. But remarkably, the human brain makes sure that now that you know where everything should be, that second rehearsal is often quite dynamic and quite stunningly good. So you'll find that even if you're running out of rehearsal time, if you've just done two rehearsals, it's normally enough. The advantage of doing a third one is it just gives you that peace of mind and allows you the additional benefit of being able to time your presentation so that you know exactly how long it's going to take and whether you need to shorten it slightly or perhaps speak a little bit slower or whatever in order to get yourself within the time that's been allocated. And one of the rules that I found that works pretty well is that it's better to be a little bit short in preparation than too long, because if you're shorter, you'll normally find something to add in that will make sure that you will end on time. So rehearsal is critically important. You can usually see if somebody hasn't rehearsed, and you can usually see if somebody has rehearsed. But usually if somebody has over-rehearsed, it often comes across as a little bit stale, and they put themselves under unnecessary pressure. So what you should be doing is that you should try and be relaxed when you do your presentation, make sure that you haven't over-rehearsed it, forget about perfection. You noticed earlier on that I made a little slip up. Does it really matter? No, because I've got my message across. So we've established that the ideal rehearsal is to be done two or three times and that that's perfectly adequate. And if you really need to do it more, a fourth time is absolutely fine. But it's really unnecessary to rehearse your presentation 17 times. But now, how do you get feedback on how well it's gone? In other words, if that presentation is really hitting the mark. Well, there are four methods that I've identified that work really well. The first one is you can have a live audience. In other words, you can have real people sitting there listening to your presentation and giving you a bit of feedback afterwards. And that's quite valuable, except that sometimes you're not always going to get a completely truthful answer because they are going to tell you what you want to hear. So, I find that a second methodology is absolutely stunningly truthful, and that is by doing your presentation in front of a mirror. And the advantage of doing it in front of a mirror is that you're presenting real time. So firstly, you're getting the auditory, but you're also getting the visual. And the visual, you can immediately pick up and see what it is that you're doing right or wrong. So if you have a habit of shuffling your feet or fiddling with your clothes or twirling your fingers around or standing in a fig leaf, you're going to pick that up by looking in the mirror and you can instantly make those adjustments. And if you make one or two practice runs in front of a mirror, you're going to find that you sort out all those body language things pretty efficiently. The third area that is probably the most powerful is by recording yourself on a camcorder, just like I'm being recorded now, uh, giving you these tips. The advantage again is that you've got both auditory and you've got visual. but you're then playing them back in delayed time. So you're not actually effectively making corrections as you're going along, but you're able to make notes and then make sure when you do the next rehearsal that you effect those changes as you go along. You can also play back the auditory without watching the video to focus specifically on the delivery of your voice, making sure that you're not speaking too fast or too slow, making sure that you're using sufficient inflection and that you simply sound interesting and engaging enough. And then the last one, is without using a camcorder at all, simply using a device which is on your phone. And the advantage of using your digital voice recorder is that you can really do it anywhere. You can be uh, waiting um, for a bus, you can be at a train station, uh, you can be in somebody's waiting room, you can be at home. It's not a question of having to spend a lot of time setting it up. Your digital voice recorder is there, so you can record snippets of your presentation and listen back for vocal clarity and to make sure that you're doing it properly. Now, let me just summarize those four methods for you. Firstly, it's the live audience. Secondly, it's the mirror. Thirdly, you have the camcorder. And fourthly, you have the digital voice recorder. And if you, all, if you use all four of these in tandem, you'll tend to find that your presentations are going to run really well. Let's discuss the visual aspect of presenting. And I'm talking specifically about how you look and how you project yourself from an image point of view to your audience. So do you always have to wear a suit and tie like I'm wearing at the moment? And the answer is most definitely no. It depends on the context of the presentation. So the very first thing you do is you consider to yourself, who am I speaking to and what am I speaking to them about? 
So for instance, if you're a game ranger doing a presentation in a game reserve, obviously you're not going to wear a suit and tie. But sometimes in what may seem like a casual environment, like a football stadium, you'll notice that the manager of the football team might wear a suit and a tie. So they make a call depending on what it is that they're trying to achieve with their presentation or whatever it is that they may be doing. Okay, so imagine if you're addressing a team of panel beaters and you're selling them a deferred compensation plan and they're all in overalls. There's going to be a degree of disconnect if you're dressed as I'm dressed right now. So normally you would then arrive perhaps with a pair of slacks on and an open neck golf shirt and make them feel a little bit more comfortable around you because there's no need to be too formal. So the question of image is very much about relatability. Will your audience relate to you? And here's a great rule of thumb that you can use. If you can simply dress one step above the audience, so if the people in the audience have got jeans on and t-shirts and you've got jeans on and an open neck shirt, you're dressed one step up, so you have that kind of authority. What you don't want to do is to be dressed a step below them because you then simply lack the authority. The other thing that you can do is dress the same, but then you, of course you need to do your research and find out how the average audience member is going to be dressed and try and choose your outfit accordingly. But I'd strongly advise you to think carefully about what you're going to wear prior to doing a presentation so that you make sure that you put yourself in a favorable position and that audience can take you seriously and do what it is that you want them to do. Gesturing is one of your key connecting tools because it makes you look really human. But one of the things that you want to avoid in terms of gestures is hand-to-face gestures because generally it gives the impression of deceit. Now, are you being deceitful if you, for instance, scratch your cheek? Well, probably not. But the origin of the hand-to-face was when Johnny was four years old and his mother asked him if he stole a sweet. And he said, no, mommy, while putting his hands up to his mouth to stop the lie from coming out. Eventually, when Johnny was six years old, he realized it was a dead giveaway, and subliminally, instead of doing this, he just rubbed his nose like that. So it almost gives the impression of Johnny telling a lie. It may simply be uncertainty, but of course, that's the same emotion. So what we advise is that you avoid any of the following hand-to-face gestures. You want to avoid the neck scratch, the collar pull, you want to avoid the scratching of the cheek or the rubbing of the eyebrow, and you certainly want to avoid the flicking of the nose because that's almost a dead giveaway, which is a bit rough for somebody like me because I get hay fever every now and then, so what am I to do? There is, however, one gesture which you can use which is not a negative gesture, and that is when you take your thumb and your forefinger and you simply rub your chin like this. This gesture indicates that you're thinking or that you're considering what the person is saying, and it isn't regarded as being negative. So let's assume that you're doing a business presentation and you are considering your image and how you're going to portray yourself to your audience. Just a few tips that will maybe be of help. I've generally found that black is the best color for shoes because it doesn't offend anybody and it doesn't draw your attention specifically to your shoes. Besides, you'd like the attention to be here. And that's the reason why suits are designed in a V so that the attention is really on the area just below your chin and of course your face. You don't want people necessarily looking at your elbow or looking at your knee. You want the attention to be over here. So a suit is often a good idea. Uh, if you have a jacket, it often looks better if it's buttoned up. So when you're doing your rehearsal, perhaps try wearing your suit buttoned up and undo it and video both and then have a look and see what they look like and you'll soon know how you should be wearing your, your jacket. Uh, when I've done my professional speaking, I very often had my jacket undone because it was less formal. But when I do a business presentation, I tend to then do the jacket up because it just looks neater and more tidy. But then again, it depends on the image that you're intending to portray. Uh, one of the rules about hair is it doesn't really matter these days whether it's long or short. What does matter is that it's under control because what you don't want is you don't want hair flopping in your face. That can be very distracting and particularly making gestures all the time to move hair away. So one or two other tips might be to make sure that your jewelry isn't too overpowering. So if you're wearing items of jewelry, make sure that they are subtle and that they don't stand out too much. Very often something like a tie or a scarf for a lady can have a contrast so that it helps to level the attention uh, in the center of your body. And then also make sure that your clothes fit you uh, properly and that they are not all over the place. And then lastly, one very important tip. Try not to have too many things in your pockets because you end up bulging in the wrong places 
and you don't want to look as if you've perhaps just got out of the shower or that uh, you didn't think properly about what you were going to wear. You want your image to look neat and tidy and when you want yourself to look highly credible. Well, it's not always possible to attend every single conference that you want to. Sometimes it's too far away, sometimes you're double booked, or sometimes you just simply don't have the time. Well, now your life is going to be so much easier because we have an amazingly powerful online television. It's called Global Conference Television. Changing the world one inspired and transformed person at a time.